Praise the Lord. God blessings to you. So good to have you again with us here on the broadcast. Thank you. And as we continue of how to win, we're talking about winning the battle against an angry dragon. We're talking about all of the provision which were made for us to win. So let us continue. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your unmeasurable love. Thank you for your unmeasurable grace and your unmeasurable goodness. And we just ask now that your Holy Spirit enlighten hearts and minds to receive all from you. All of you and none of me. Be it so now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we were talking about winning the battle against an angry devil. And we see that God has empowered us where we can win. God has empowered us and we're going to talk about that. Understanding the battle which took place in heaven, we, we were going over it. We talked about how the dragon got kicked out. He no longer has authority in heaven. And so to understand the battle on earth, one must understand the battle which took place in heaven. And even in the prayer, Jesus, Matthew 6 and 10, thy will be done in earth as it in heaven. We see in heaven the dragon is kicked out. And God has empowered us so we can kick him out of our life through the blood of Jesus. So he already got kicked out of heaven. And we hear this prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, the devil is kicked out. And we get the opportunity to kick him out of our lives. And not only kick him out of our lives, but we can destroy his authority here on earth when we walk in the light of the understanding of we can be more than conquerors, when we walk into the light of understanding to understand no weapon formed against us to prosper, when we walk in the light of the understanding of knowing that a thousand may fall by our side, ten thousand at our right hand it should not come nigh us. Now, when you look at Satan's clever, deceptive plan to sabotage the birth of, of the man-child by the woman, Satan's deceptive plan to sabotage the man-child, and this woman who is with child, he may not understand all the dynamics of it, but his goal was to, to destroy and to kill the man-child as soon as it was born. I don't know how the, the devil thought he could pull that one off without getting caught. That certainly is a lot of pride. That certainly is a lot of arrogance. His goal to feel that he could pull this off, kill the man-child, saw the woman with the child. This is Revelation chapter 12 starting off in verse 1, where John sees this great mystery, a woman clothed in the sun, moon under her feet, and upon her head twelve stars. So it's very interesting to me, but his intent is to take out the child, and he's waiting patiently to take the child out. But Satan missed the child slipped away. Okay, so now there's focus shift to the woman to take her out and to kill her. But she also slips away into her secret place. So she slips away to her secret place in the wilderness. So now, all that waiting, trying to take the man child out because he saw 
the woman was pregnant and in pain to be delivered and his goal was to devour the child as soon as it was born and the child get away. The child is taken up to God and to his throne. And he used to rule the nation with a rod of iron. He gets away. Okay. Now, since that one got away, since the child got away, his attention now is on the woman to take her out and kill her. But she also slips away. She slips away into the wilderness and can't be found. And now, think about it. You missed the child. The woman got away from you too. She's in the wilderness. Can't be found. She's there for an appointed time. And not until the appointed time is done, but she can't be found. And what we see is the angry devil. He's so outdone in his pride and his rage and arrogance. And he unjustly provoked authority in heaven. And he refused to back down. And then this is where we see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, there's war in heaven. And Satan started this war. Now think about that. Of course, in his own pride, he got whipped twice. Actually, he got whipped more than that, but he got whipped twice. So all these angels, he had tricked. And of course, he talks about the, the enemy. And it talks about it in Revelation. He deceived a third of the stars of heaven. So a third of the angels were in coordination with him, deceived, and they all were badly beaten. And so the third of the angels suffered similar loss as did Satan. The dragon is badly beaten. The third of the angels who were fighting alongside Satan, they also were badly beaten. And in reality, if you say it like this, Satan received a mortal wound. And I believe his angels received similar. And he's kicked out into the earth. He no longer have a place in heaven. The angels which rebel with him loses their place and their job as well. And he's banded. Lucifer don't have an office and neither a home in heaven. And he's an outcast. The dragon is angry because he's cast out to the earth. And so now he's already got beaten twice. He got beaten in heaven and this woman gets away. He's cast out to the earth. And now his whole battle, he's now on the earth. And his battle shifts here from the scene in heaven to the earth. Now, the scripture talks about our ability, whatever we bind on the earth, we be bind in the heavens. And it also mentioned vice versa. Whatever we loose on the earth will be loose in the heaven. So another fact that we will talk about. So the angry devil, of course, when we talk about demons, this is what we're talking about. Those, those spirits, those, those entities, those who had coordinated with the enemy, who had coordinated with the dragon, who had coordinated with the serpent, the devil, Satan, who thought through their pride and arrogance, they could upseat or they could impede or they could prevent the manifestation of whatever it is that God is planning, whatever it is that God is orchestrating, whatever it is that God is doing. Their pride got in the way and they thought they could prevent this from taking place and they lose their job, lose their place, and lose their citizenship. And they, all of them receive a mortal wound and these, these angels now cast out, they cast into the earth along with Satan. And this is where we get those demons from. So the demons and devils and Say that as long as man operate in obedience to the covenants of the Lord, they're all subject unto, unto to us. They all, when I say subject, they're subject through and by the blood of Jesus. If you may recall out of the 10th chapter of Luke, 
Jesus' disciples came back rejoicing because the even the devils were there subject to that name. And of course, we see Jesus says, he says, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Well, yes, he got kicked out and the devil hit his, his cohorts. The rest of the angels which rebelled got kicked out with him. But here's what Jesus says. Don't rejoice because the devils are subject to you or demons are subject to you. But rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. Here's a principle that we can understand is very important. In other words, it's one thing to have those forces subject to it, but it's another thing to be in fellowship with God. It's another thing to be in submersive with God. It's another thing to restore the breach and the contract so that we, we can take full benefit of choosing the opportunity to not just exist in a time state, but to connect with the ability which was made possible so that we could choose an eternal state of eternal life and eternal fellowship, eternal peace, eternal joy, fullness of joy and pledges forevermore is the opportunity we get. So Satan is cast out, angels cast out with him. They're angry. They lost those two manipulation that they tried in heaven. They're here on the earth and their focus is to take out the woman. But he loses again. And she slips away into the wilderness. Again, she's given two wings, fly away into the wilderness for an appointed time to hide from the face of the serpent of the dragon. And she can't be found. So here he is. He knows she's in there somewhere. He can't find her. So the angry serpent, what do he do? He casts out of his mouth a flood, great a water, great water as a mighty flood. So that the woman would be taken away by the flood to kill her that way. But the dragon loses again. He, so he knows he's in there. So the serpent casts out of his mouth water as a great flood that the woman would be destroyed by it. But he loses again. The earth fight back. The earth is in on the fight. Because this time the earth helped the woman. And the scripture talks about the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the water, swallowed up the flood. Now, previously, Michael had helped the woman in the scene in heaven. But when we look at the scene on the earth, the earth helped the woman. And Satan having great wrath, he, he loses again. And he having great wrath, his whole focus shift now is to attack her seed. All who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus is where his focus then becomes. Now it's our turn to win. Michael, the angel Michael, and his angels won against Satan and his angels in heaven. The earth handed him a defeat when the dragon tried to flush the woman out of the wilderness, when the dragon tried to flush the woman out of her hiding, now it's our turn. He has shifted his fight to us, the remnant of, of her seed. We can win. We can win individually or, or collectively through and by the blood of Jesus which powers us. Jesus said it in Revelation 1 and 18, he says, all powers is given unto me in the heaven and in the earth. And he has the keys 
of hell and death. So, Jesus said this as he was telling his disciples that the things that I'll do, shall ye do. And he goes, because he says, I go unto my father, and he says, I send you a comforter. Who is that comforter? The Holy Ghost. The spirit which was which raised Jesus from the dead shall bring life into our mortal bodies. When we will, will become submersive in the Holy Ghost, we become more than conquerors. So now is our turn to win. And we can win when we take up our cross, when we put on the whole armor, we can be more than conquerors. When we put on the whole armor, then no weapon formed against us to prosper. When we put on the whole armor and become submersive in the word, then yes, we can trample the young lion and the dragons under our feet. That we can tread upon the lion and the adder and can trample the young lion and the dragons under our feet. So yes, now it is our turn. The fight has shifted to us. And we have the opportunity to win. And we don't have to. Right here now, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. Listen. The ill, the problem of, when we look at it from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, had the prince of this world known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, the biggest throne, the biggest injury to the forces of the enemy came with the resurrection of Christ from the dead, crucified, innocent, and in the courts of heaven, it is settled. The first Adam caused us to lose everything, the second Adam brought everything back said it before us and told us to choose life. And when we operate in that choice, we become more than conquerors. So our obedience to the laws and statutes of God make us undefeatable. We become more than conquerors. So the goal of the enemy is for us to never operate in the full spectrum of what is made available to us. So yes, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, but the devil believes and trembles. And he also believes and trembles when he sees people who actually become submersive in the principles of God and the word of God. Not just coming to Jesus, but beginning to learn of him and his word abiding in them. This is one of the biggest fear to the enemy and so he will offer you the world he will offer you everything he will offer you anything and everything that he offers has an expiration date and time and whatever you have it will never bring you joy he will give you whatever uh, whatever you wish but it always carry a great price with it so yes Satan is cast to the earth and he redirects his fight toward the woman in the wilderness when she gets away. And so as we talked about it, the earth help, now it's our turn and we can win. We can win against an angry devil. There is a principle set. Now listen, I hear people talk about how hard it is to be, it's, it's, I don't know whether to say it's comical. I, I, I don't know how to necessarily frame it, but I will say it like this. Some people say, well, it's easy. Some says it's hard. Whenever you choose to follow Christ, some says, well, it, it, problems don't go away. It, it, it escalates. Well, let me put it to you like this. If we're operating in ignorance, we can certainly be, we can go through a lot of pain and suffering. Many are the affliction of the righteous. But I'm here to tell you, there is, you want to talk about the hard way to live is in sin. But there is nothing harder than that. The hardness of being a Christian is in no way comparison to how hard and destructive it is to live in sin. Now, let's put it this way. Jesus said, he said, learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, 
our burden is, is not light when we choose not to follow those simple principles. And this is what makes it very challenging for, for a young Christian that comes to, to know God because there will be a, a thousand, a million obstacles to stand in their way so that they never come to learn of him as they should. And this is why he said, learn of me. Why? Now, we don't learn of him. It's going to be a hard walk. If you don't learn of the Lord Jesus, as you, when you accept him into your life and you don't learn of him. Now, when I say this, I'm not saying this because I'm saying that it's wrong. Let me give you an example. If the enemy can have you watching every football game, every baseball game, every basketball game, every and every, now I enjoy sports too. But listen, the goal of the enemy, he will always offer you anything that you like and we become excessive in it. And when you begin to take on more of that, when you really need to be able to, to fight against the enemy, there, there is nothing in the bank. So whatever it is, so even with sports that may not necessarily be harmful until we get to the excessive end, but the enemy is not just that. He will take it further than that to any level of whatever it might be, whatever your taste, whatever your forte, whatever your desire, whatever your heart's desire, as long as you never learn of him. And so many Christians, when they come, this is part of the fight. It is a spiritual battle, warring for your mind, warring for your heart, warring for your soul, warring for your spirit. How many times before we came to know the Lord, we pursued things, thought it would bring us a certain level of satisfaction once we got it? There was no satisfaction in it. And there are so many others in the pursuit. It do not matter what it is, whether it's the next house, or the better house, or the bigger house, or the next car, bigger car, better car, whatever that pursuit, whether it's a career, whatever kind of career, whether it's a degree, once you get there, then what? Unless Christ is in the equation, it's still emptiness. With all the toys and junk we may acquire, it is still emptiness. There is something missing because we're not connected to life. The only way we connect to life is when we allow Christ to come in. And then it's one thing to allow him to come in. It's now become necessary for us to take on it, to breathe it. It's just like that child that once he comes out of the womb and they give him a spank to, to liven up, to get that heart to, and to get the lungs be able to start taking in there. Once we have come to know the Lord, once we accepted him into our life, it now become necessary that we really become to know of him. The more we know of him, the less difficult the journey, the less difficult, the less hard it is. That's why he said, learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The, but it is the way of a transgressor is hard. Now that's where the real job, the real toughness, when the enemy is able to run roughshod into your life and to destroy it at will. So the Lord has given us a certain amount of ability, a certain, and let me use this analogy. Israel was given a charge when they came through the Red Sea, came into after they got through the Red Sea, they have the opportunity to walk over to the promised land. And there's a certain charge given unto Israel. As they go out into the land of Canaan, these people are being expelled because they're operating in rebellion and they are breaking all the moral guidelines and rule and a disrespect for existence, a disrespect for kids and childs and the murder and the rape and destruction and carnage. So God had an agreement with a group of people who were to be judges in the sense of the, should I say, holies no more than a simple word as well. That may not be the best of term or words to use, but they're supposed to be the salt. They're supposed to be the the, the neutralizer to, to, to prevent, to stop the carnage of evil and corruption 
and the, the lack of moral decency and the destruction of little babies and boys and every conceivable evil and wickedness which are taking place, Israel was set aside to, to be, should I say, the chastising tool to these that will operate in rebellion. It, it's the same thing as a father would use the rod or use a belt or use whatever, a switch, to bring guidance. But here Israel is used to be that tool of correction to, the, to these nations who are operating in rebellion of all the principles and guidelines and all the disrespect of life to, to, to these other, to little kids or whatever. And so he, he gave them some guideline and rules. When you come into these nations, don't do what they did. If you do what they did, you will receive of similar punishment, but double, because we have this understanding. And so this is why as they come into the land of Canaan, they're supposed to remove. And these, all these nations are supposed to be removed and destroyed because of their rebellion. It's their own rebellion is, of course, the scripture is used in another, another place. The scripture talks about how evil men don't live out half their days. So we do have some evil shall slay the wicked. As we look into the 34th Psalm, I believe it's 34 and 21. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. And of course, the goal of the enemy is this is part of the deal. As Romans 6 and 23 says, the wages of sin is death. The goal of the enemy is to, to make a deal, and most people that's operating in rebellion is unaware of the fine print of that deal. He's offer you whatever. He'll offer you the world for the worship. And the worship is your soul, is your life. And here's what Romans 6 and 23 says. The wages of sin is death. Any person who operate in rebellion to make a deal with the enemy, he will give you whatever because he knows it allows him the ability to do what he specialized in, according to John 10 and 10. The thief cometh but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Every person who ever makes a deal with the enemy, it will cost you everything, and it will cost you your soul. So the question is asked, what does it profit to gain the world and lose your soul? You may have whatever it is that you have right now, but when innocent bloodshed is an illusion or deception if you think that's power, it is a destructive power that's shortening your days. Every evil and every wickedness is taking days off. And, and so what it's doing is building an account against your own soul with the enemy. And there will be a collection. And this is one of the scam jobs that, that those who have climbed the ranks never have any peace, never have any joy. They got stuff and toys. And it doesn't matter how much they climb the ranks. There is an expiration date. And, it, and when that vapor leaves, the after result is unbelievable misery and pain for an eternity. And it's in this state only that we get a chance to make a choice, to choose the provision which was made for us, to get out of this time state based on our choice and be able to go to an eternal life to live forever in a place that's unimaginable. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, haven't entered into our hearts the thing which God has prepared unto them that love him. It is referred to as the enemy, and of course, in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, it referenced him as the one that sealeth the sum and full of wisdom. In verses 9 through 24, gives a very, very deep insight of the, the pride and the arrogance of the enemy. So when we see the great mystery, it ties in with what's taking place here. Every nation which forget God is accelerating the expiration. Every nation, every leader who, who take God out of the, the equation their own pride and arrogance is destroying them and is accelerating the expiration date. 
One of the things that Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, we see this very powerful angel. He comes down from heaven. And he cries out, Babylon, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen. And what really stood out, he says, and has become the habitation of devils. A lot of nations get big, become prosperous, and then they pull the lever of pride and arrogance and take God out of the equation. When I hear Revelation 18, and when he says this, 18 and 2, and has become the habitation of devils and the hole of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. There was a level of progression and arrogance which brought their demise. Every nation which forget God is basically put the nail in their own coffin and has signed their own suicide note. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of, so when we're talking about winning against an angry devil, part of that battle is gaining understanding to know the fight. All the ills that are happening around this world, and I've been redundant in this series, did not come from God. All the ills that are happening around the world is not God's doing. It's an angry devil. It's an angry dragon because he knows he has but a short time. Revelation chapter 13 verse 6 reference this, this beast blaspheming God, blaspheming his name, blaspheming the tabernacle and blaspheming those that dwell in heaven. Operating in arrogance that he knows he has but a short time and he gets away with it. He has a, a short time. And here we see as he escalates his fight in the 13th chapter of Revelation, this beast, as he escalates his fight, power is given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome. In this battle, to overcome, he wins. Well, he wins physically because we're told to hold on and we win by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and we love not our life unto the death, which means when you become submersive in the word of God, the flesh don't profit anything. When we walk in the spirit, then the more we become submersive in the word, we do not deny his name and neither do we deny the faith. So the goal of the enemy is when this, the ship of this violence began to take place, the goal of the enemy is for us to value the flesh more than the spirit. And where our true investment should be, the soul. Fear, don't fear those who can destroy the body, is what Jesus said, but fear him who has the power to destroy both body, soul, and spirit. This is where our fear should be. One of the things that we notice here, there is a final showdown, there is a final end date, there is a final time that's coming around. The battle is on. We, we, the battle is on. Jesus said, thief cometh, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he says, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. 
So we see all the ills of the world, the releasing of that secure lid, allowing an angry devil to get out, brought every level of chaos you could ever imagine. Death, pain, sorrow, murders, sorcerers, liars, homongers, you name it. And it just goes on. Every destroyed family, divorce, envy, jealous, jealousy, bitterness, every ill you can think of, cancer, plague, tsunami, every hurricanes, tornadoes to, to destroy, and now listen, everything that you can ever think about, pestilence, flies, every, every ill you can ever imagine, every ill you can ever imagine, the enemy, every misery that could ever come to you is by an angry devil. And yet, strategically, the enemy has so deceptively and so, how do I put the word, sold it so well through propaganda and lies and ignorance. It sold it so well and sometimes even unintentional declared by people who love God some error as far as where the real battle is. And so many have been disarmed through ignorance thinking or believing they're doing God a favor. Now granted you if they truly love God when their works is tried everything is burned up but their soul is saved. There's nothing in their account because it was not based on learning of him as they should. It's one thing to become submersive in something that somebody teaches contrary to the word of God. And here's where the word tells us, of course, the enemy do have angels who will appear as angel of light. There are some that's out there maliciously and there are others out there who with good intentions didn't take the time to, to learn of him as they should, but have taken the words of these malicious leaders who are in tandem with the enemy to hinder you from progressing in your ability to be overcomers, to be winners in the fight of an angry dragon. Notice what Paul says. He says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 19, he says, For I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputers of this world? Oftentimes, we choose to believe what we hear based on the amount of supposedly man knowledge or how many degrees, how many doctrines. And, but we found out from the word of God that the foolishness of God is wiser than men's. Paul went far enough to say, you see your calling, brother, is not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many mighty, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and things that are, are base and things that are despised and things that are not. What is Paul saying? He's saying some of the greatest, let me put it to you like this. Some of the greatest breakthroughs that have come through people who are instruments for God were people who didn't necessarily climb the ranks of the greatest, of the best college, of the best school, but they had a relationship with God. God has used people who, wait a minute, where did he come from? He doesn't have a third grade education. Or how, how does he do what he do? It's like the blind man in chapter, uh, chapter 9 of St. John. I don't know. How do you receive your sight? You were born blind. How, how, tell me what did he do? And who is he? What do you say? What do you say that he is? I don't know. All I know is I was once blind, but now I see. God have used a number of instruments that in 
the world of sophistication and of the pursuit of knowledge and to pursue, listen, all the education in the world can never substitute for a relationship with God. There is, and this is why Paul says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All this pursuit with God, iron equation, it might as well be counted as dumb. Paul said that himself. I counted it all dumb. He said it in Philippians. But for the excellency of Christ. Now, gratitude, when you're able to filter whatever education you're getting, and you're able to filter it through the word of God, you're able to, that, that's where it really becomes to be a great blessing because whatever you do will prosper and you'll leave with wither. So as we're looking at winning against an angry devil, these are, the, we're going to go through all the various principles here as we're talking about winning, how to win the battle against an angry dragon, how to win the battle against an angry devil. Price has already been paid for. And I want to encourage you to begin to use those tools, begin to use those steps, because as you use those steps, you can bring um, blessings in everything that you do. Whatever you do will prosper and you leave with it. You're able to bring blessings to your household and to all that you do. And others will be baffled because when you gain favor from God, it also opens up favor from people as well. And he will prosper you in all that you do. We can win against the devil. And as you win the balance against, you win the battle against envy, against strife, against jealousy, against all those various tools the enemy uses, we are able to win against those as we become submersive in the word of God. So again, I want to thank you for the time that you spent here. And I want you to really just, if you would, to all listeners, to really value the price paid to provide for you all the tools to be more than conquerors because in the end what he has for us is beyond imagination. So God blessings to you and whatever you do, stay in the fight. Bless win. Those wherever they are in their homes, wherever they are on the jobs and the cars, healing come forth now. Deliverance come forth now. Breakthrough come forth now. In the mighty name of Jesus, be made whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be made whole. Hallelujah. Be made whole. The blood of Jesus make thee whole. The blood of Jesus makes thee whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be whole in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and in your spirit. Every shackle be broken now. Every wall come down in your life now. Joy of the Lord come forth. Peace of the Lord come forth. In Jesus' mighty name. And whatever that be, that's a special prayer request. We're standing and we're touching and we're agreeing with those requests now. In Jesus' mighty name. Be it so. Be it so. Be it so. Every wall down in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And those things that we need to pray, that the things that we don't know how. We pray that the Holy Ghost will intercede in those areas. In Jesus' mighty name, we commit this into the Lord Most High, and it is so. It is so. It is so. Because your eyes is upon the righteous, and your ears is open to that cry, that whenever the righteous cry, you hear it, and you deliver it out of all their troubles. The angel of the Lord encampers round about them that Fear him and deliver them. And we thank you, mighty God, because your word declared it to a thousand shall fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand. It won't come nigh us. We'll see it with our eyes, but it won't happen to us. We thank you. Let, let it be our passion always to be in your secret place. We thank you for the miracles today. Thank you for the healings today. Thank you for the breakthrough today. And even now, as we're touching and agreeing, because your word said we're in to touch and agree, you would give it us. We would stand touch and agree, you would give it us. And we believe your word, we stand upon your word, we turn it down in Jesus' mighty name, and it is so. Hallelujah. It is so. Glory. It is so. Mighty God, thank you. Thank you for hearing us. 
Thank you for breakthrough this day. Thank you for deliverance this day. Thank you for change of heart, change of mind, change of spirit, change of soul. Unmeasurable is your love. Unmeasurable is your goodness. Unmeasurable. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty Father, that you love us that much. You give us access, and it is, it is, it is your will to give us the kingdom. And we thank you for that, mighty God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you that whenever the righteous call, you hear it and deliver us from all that trouble. Thank you for victory today. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. And it is so. so again, go in peace. Enjoy the blessings of the Lord. He is for you. And it brings some pleasure when God's children operates. And God's children began to utilize those gifts, those ability healing it to children's bread. And it brings God's pleasure whenever we operate upon his word. We take those things that rightfully belongs to us that he's already paid the price for. Christ paid the price for it all. He was the one that poured out his soul on the death and numbered with the transgressors, buried the sins of many, and interceded for the transgressors. That's the kind of unmeasurable love that Christ has for us. And Jesus went poor enough to say, evil fathers know how to give good gifts to their kids. And how much more would the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? The scriptures stated in Luke 18 and and one about always to pray and not to think. And there are times we won't feel like praying. I can attest that some of my greatest breakthroughs and healing was when I didn't feel like praying. And I had to admit that to the Lord, Lord, here I am. And I don't feel like praying. I really don't even know what to say. I know I love you. And when those words left my tomb, the Holy Spirit interceded and began to pray began to enter act in things that I didn't know how to say. One of the greatest breakthroughs. Normally, 10 minutes of prayer and I'm about done, but this was so awesome and beautiful. Three and a half hours later, after I was done praying, I thought I had only prayed 15 minutes, and it's something you need to be in God's presence. And it's available to all of God's children. God has no respect of a person. It is true you draw nigh to Him, and He will draw nigh to you. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Whatever you do, continue to stand. When you've done everything, that's what Jesus said it best. In 18 and 1, you will always pray and not to fail. God bless you. Love you. Until next time, go in victory, go in peace, go in love. In Jesus' name.